I want to give you a short overview of what happened during these two evenings. Uh, the first evening, uh, we divided ourselves in three groups and we discussed the three questions you formulated. I have to say the discussions were so, we were discussing so hard and we got so excited that we completely forgot to divide any roles like who is the shaker, who is the mover. So we were not moving at all in the sense you would like us to move, but there was a lot of movement within the groups and we really had the feeling to be uh, working on connected intelligence nevertheless. Uh, the second evening, we selected one subject, uh -huh. and that was the question uh, related to uh, work opportunities in networking environments. And this evening, we worked Any in time. two groups. No? Yeah. And well, just to give you an impression, I want to tell you something about uh, the group in which I worked myself. We first started with a brainstorm session about uh, identifying variables or factors which must be met to um, may have to be able to make business in the next five or ten years. Well, we came up with a very long list of maybe 30 or 35 different uh, concepts. Well, to reduce this number of concepts, we uh, searched for some basic rules which, that we could find in this long list also to make it more easy to handle this list of uh, concepts. Main. Well, finally we came up with four uh, basic rules and we will introduce you in that uh, later. And um, with the other uh, variables we identified, uh, we defined uh, dimensions which we allocated to these four basic rules. Unfortunately, one evening was really too short to work out these dimensions or to work out these basic rules. So, well, we hope to do that in the near future, but we hope to give you an impression anyway of what were the results of this evening. Okay, yeah, like uh, Thomas said, I'd like to introduce uh, not one, but, but two, in fact, two of the variables that we discussed in the uh, workshops. <clears throat> the first one of importance uh, uh, that, I w that I wish to cover is a knowledge worker filter that you see on the, uh, on the PowerPoint presentation screen there. Um, <clears throat> now, the way I see it is that uh, currently we're experiencing an exponential growth in the amount of information that we're dealing with. And uh, as our old books that we've uh, written and uh, sound bites that we've recorded and so on become more increasingly available online, we have more and more information that we need to filter through. And uh, so the position of knowledge worker, uh, information filterer becomes more and more important as we move into, uh, into this electronic age. And, um, uh, I also want to clarify that when we were discussing uh, the idea of a filter, we're not necessarily talking about a, a, an individual human filter or someone who works for an organization. This could also mean an intelligent agent where we have, we have a, a computer program that allows us, uh, that runs on an algorithm or something that allows us to make certain selections as to what kind of information should be, should be coming in, what kind of uh, information should be filtered out. A good example of that would be our, uh, our email communication where you can set up your email to, uh, to reject some messages and ex uh, accept others. And this is, so this is one issue that, uh, or one variable rather, that we discussed in the workshops. The second one <clears throat> that I'm going to introduce is uh, virtual identity structure versus real identity. This is somehow linked with the knowledge worker filter issue that I just discussed. Um, what I want to push towards, or what I want to get at, is how the nature of identity is changing with electronic culture. And this is well documented in the medium theory literature with uh, McLuhan and Ong and Merowitz and what have you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the issue uh, then for business is how, how, do, how does one select how to portray oneself online because one can do so. Um, and whether or not this is in fact a position where someone could be hired to, to create images for people in, uh, in some kind of business environment online in the future. Uh, it's sort of a PR work type thing. And then, and then uh, tied with this or coupled with this is the notion of uh, uh, individual identity or real identity as opposed to this virtual identity and what happens with that as we, increasing, as we increase the amount of virtual identities that one individual can have, uh, what happens to uh, the previous notion, so a structuralist notion of, a, of an individual identity that, that, uh, that is whole and complete uh, and isolated unto itself. Um, and again, this is well documented by Burks, by uh, Merowitz, and Poster, and so on. So, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. This is just uh, another variable or another issue that, that uh, was brought up in the workshops and stimulated a lot of discussion. I can imagine. Well, uh, these are just uh, two of the examples of discussions we had. I move uh, forward to 
the self-satisfying worker. We had a, an, a discussion on it that <laughs> in future we feel, uh, and I didn't pick the picture, it was Robert who did, <laughs> together with Marco Polo. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice picture, uh, by Fischl. <laughs> you're, you're too far away for punishment. <laughs> uh, but um, we feel that, um, you know, the issue of where, you know, the current mode of thinking still is that companies are providing goods or services or even current uh, uh, literature is describing the experience uh, economy, you know, uh, thinking out of the, the, the state of uh, providing services and experience to somebody. We, we feel with the generic infrastructure, such as we have discussed earlier, it would be possible for an individual to um, go online uh, in self-satisfying pro processing. And actually, uh, the uh, steering of the consumer would be more than ever consumer-driven. And actually, uh, you can then uh, choose and seek the satisfaction you as an individual would want. Um, so that's one uh, notion. Um, another one, and uh, Professor de Bakker, who is uh, teaching in our postdoctoral courses, he's talking about that the information economy is actually reshaping our roles. Uh, our roles in terms of, um, there are roles for authors, those who are providing content, those who are uh, facility providers, service providers, and actually, we, we would like to look within our discussion with the McLuhan program to the various roles that uh, come about in the future. But at the same time, we are thinking that it's not the role itself, but it's the connection between one role and the other, and the tension and the deliverance of value between those two uh, roles, or uh, two, three, or many roles. The nodes uh, are more important uh, than the roles uh, individually. Um, in fact, in one of our discussions, um, uh, somebody from our government, uh, Mr. Bert Mulder, he said, there will only be an exchange of value between individuals or computers or computers and individual if there is such a thing as a difference between those uh, two uh, parties. And uh, so there can be transmission of something uh, between those. So we feel that roles and notes have a, a great deal to do with that. And, and also with identity, I guess. <clears throat> and with identity. Mm -hmm. what, what, what we don't know yet, Derek, is we made, for that reason, we said we make postcards. We know that all these notions are part of a family of postcards, but we don't know yet how they, inter how they interconnect. Why work? Well, we see an erosion of the separation between work and leisure. And that's in separate no. uh, in time, but also in place. Uh, information technology allows us to work at home, but also to have contact with the rest of the world yeah. from our working yeah, place. In our group, we discovered that this uh, erosion is going so far that we have hardly any empty time anymore, as we said. We have working hours, we have leisure, but both are usually planned full with activities. We have hardly any empty time, which we define as time which is not planned. And we see that as something to worry about. Thank you, uh, Elseline. Uh, actually, we agreed uh, very much with uh, the, the, the postcard, Why Work? And uh, I think we'll have to make a, a postcard uh, for the Institute and post it on all the walls in, uh, in Amsterdam. <laughs> it, um, <laughs> um, on the same um, uh, PowerPoint sheet, uh, we talk uh, about management of diversity and complexity. And this was discussed in, uh, in our groups, uh, uh, not at length, but uh, within a short time, in depth. And actually, I think there's a lot of employment opportunities there. Let's ponder on the, thought, uh, on the issue of diversity. Um, uh, many cultures, many people of many races, many religions, male, female, old and young, this is all called diversity. Issues within KPMG, Morat Ernst Young Consultants, as to how to deal with uh, a culture with this complexity of many cultures working together. And how do you manage di uh, diversity? Now let's ponder on an example. 
Let's assume that I'm a housewife. I'm 35 years of age and I'm well educated. I chose to have children at age 30. I have two. They are uh, at kindergarten at age five, uh, but I don't want to uh, uh, have them raised by somebody else. So I'm working at home. Uh, I can contribute. I can be online. Uh, I am a lawyer and I can be uh, uh, given a time slot to give online consultancy on all kinds of uh, 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 legal issues and I have my time slots as if and when as a housewife I want to combine that with raising my children. This is one way of uh, uh, being in a diversified world where contributions can be made based on this new uh, 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 open infrastructure that we're already having but not uh, used to uh, using. Same with elderly people. In our country, in the Netherlands, only 25% of 50 years and over are working. And this is why I say, why work? Because I'm uh, uh, 50, so uh, three of my age group are not working. Well, isn't that a waste of energy? Could that, that not be turned around to where we use the energy of those 50 years and over? And maybe it's not work in the sense of uh, paid work, but it might be in the sense of one of my colleagues, he is uh, um, a pensioner and he's uh, flown uh, last week to the Caribbean to help set up a hotel school. You know, isn't that also a contribution, unpaid work to society? How can we manage diversity and get all those that have energy, talent, connected through the uh, uh, generic infrastructure, uh, which we call uh, internet or otherwise, and have this diversity help our world. Okay, I hope you have tears in your eyes by now. <laughs> <laughs> actually, the two uh, postcards, they're just there for fun because um, actually one picture, I don't know whether that's a tent or somebody's bottom. Um, I did like the female. That, that was uh, a, a thought they, that they, they were picked by Robert. <laughs> But fragmentation and cohesion and scatter and gather, I think they are, you know, if, if you're wanting to make money, um, you know, I think it's a, a, an infopreneur of the future will have to understand these notions as to, you know, maybe uh, get 100,000 scattered ideas and then try and gather them again and try and create value out of them, just as what we are doing at, at present. Mm -hmm. And I feel that there will be a world of fragmentation, like individual employed people, people working in small units, but there will also be room for large institutions or communities where people will find cohesion. So there will be two ways uh, of existence, fragmented and, um, you know, like in groups and gathered uh, issues. But we, we need to understand that, you know, in the past we probably we're only seeking cohesion. We were only trying to gather. We were thinking in terms of rock logic and we uh, uh, didn't let go into the world of liquid logic. Mm -hmm. And we should let go more often than hold. Okay. This <laughs> is pretty cool. <laughs> we are turning to our next sheet to complete our presentation in the next three minutes. How we're doing? We we're doing fine. Can you... Yes. Uh, would you be kind enough? To speed up a little bit, I will t talk about peace and quiet. <laughs> we live on high speed, workload increases, and also in our private life, we are running from one activity to another. Many people have the feeling that we are lived, and in fact, we don't want to be lived. So there is an increasing need for peace and quiet, not only to be quiet, but also to find some time for reflection and to don't run only forward, but also to look back or to, boost, to look around where we are and where we want to go from there. Okay. I will also um, elaborate a little bit on the postcards of translation of cultures. In our global economy, uh, an important point of attention is cultures and differences between cultures and the translations which are necessary to bring cultures together. Translation in the literal sense of the word, by means of translating from one language to the other or from one symbol system to another symbol system, but also translation of meaning, taking into account cultural differences. 
Okay. Actually, each one of these postcards could fill one evening of uh, discussion, um, preferably with a brandy in an open fireplace. Well, the interesting part is we let our uh, discussion flow and we found with these postcards, in hindsight, that we weren't discussing jobs like the cleaner, the painter, the doctor, and the sister, and the teacher. We were actually uh, on a more abstract level, but we'll come to that in just one second after this commercial message. <laughs> <laughs> Andres, will you go into identity? Uh... Oh, I didn't realize I was going to. Sure. Uh, <laughs> That's um, it. Okay, the final postcard that I would look at, uh, and that was discussed in the workshops, is identity versus collective. Um, I'm not so sure exactly what to say about this, but it, it, it ties in. <laughs> It ties in quite well with the, the idea of uh, virtual identity structure that I was discussing just a few minutes ago, where we can see uh, the electronic age is somehow changing our notions of identity. Um, and I think this, this changes our whole notion of how we act, act collectively as well. And, uh, when, when we talk about uh, electronic uh, or, or connected intelligence, we can, think, um, we can think about the changing nature of democracy um, or online, online membership to different groups, be it Greenpeace, be it... Uh, be, what have you, and, and uh, transnational uh, movements are, are being facilitated by this kind of by this kind of uh, connectivity. So I think uh, the overall gist is that the electronic age is changing our very notion of what an individual identity is, and at the same time, is changing a notion of what it is that that constitutes our collective identity. You know, where are we pushing towards in the future? I'll leave it at that. Okay. Yeah. Um, next sheet, uh, please, Robert. Um, you, so you can see our postcards are, you know, more or less leading uh, uh, to an abstract way of thinking. They're thinking, uh, if you look at, at, at these postcards uh, about uh, business, about enterprise, about employment, it has become more or less an ab abstract conceptual architecture rather than a very concrete architecture like job descriptions, uh, uh, etc., laying down what work should be done in what time. Um, and all we know is that uh, these postcards are interesting enough to, to, uh, to uh, study and also what they mean uh, between each postcard and on the nodes of uh, new roles to be defined, we feel that there, where there is energy, there, that there, where there is a flow and transaction, there will be employment uh, and also value to be added. Um, so El Samik will uh, conclude with uh, about seven uh, dimensions that we feel are worth uh, at this point as a deliverable, first deliverable in our uh, discussion with you. And that's our last uh, uh, sheet. Yes. And we think that uh, there will be work for people who understand these dimensions, who understand the difference between the dimensions and the characteristics of the dimensions. I will explain them very shortly because we have just a few minutes of time. The first one, to make sense, which has to do with content, with context, with history, with future, with generating meaning. And who doesn't understand how to make sense will result in nonsense or complete confusion, which is an undesired situation. Trust has to do with reputation, accountability, responsibility, which we found actually some key issues for success. If there is no trust, there will be distrust, and in the worst case, even violence. Flow or dynamics is an important element. Flow is not enough in itself. There, have, there must also be moments of hold, moments of reflection, moments to keep ourselves a, a mirror to see where we are and where we want to go. We have to take care of communities, the public space, the public infrastructure, but also at the same time we have to make sure to take care for the individual and the identity. We have to think about work in the traditional meaning, which has to do with, uh, well, you have to earn money, you have to work to earn money, you have to do your duty. But there is also work in the future. Is it still work? Do we want to use the word work if we are doing the things we like to do, if we are if work and leisure are combined. And we have to do with the knowledge worker, and the knowledge worker will only be successful if he's able to deal with complexity. 
And finally, we are talking a lot about knowledge and we need more knowledge and more knowledge services. But knowledge alone uh, has no right to exist. We also need intuition to succeed. Um, I would like very much to uh, ask the audience, I've been talking a lot. Now to do this, if you, if you don't mind, we'll have a little ritual. I'm going to have, it's, unfortunately, we, we don't have a uh, microphone system that works throughout the whole room in the same way. So you'll have to do as you would in, uh, in a conference, come up to the microphone, so to speak. So Paul, can you come and then that way you can be seen. So uh, Paul Levinson would like to say a few words, I think, about the... Uh, well, uh, I, I was... Uh, I no, I, I've been introduced already. Um, I was especially interested in uh, one of the opening postcards uh, on the question of, of online identity. Um, in our online classes over the last decade, uh, the question has frequently arisen, how do we know who the students are uh, as they're taking courses? For example, how can we tell if, uh, if it's a student uh, who's signing on one week uh, and next week it's the student's friend masquerading as uh, under his identity or the student's father or grandfather or grandmother for that matter. At the same time as we talk about lifelong learning to something more akin to lifelong earning and that leaves us not much time for relaxing or retirement and that's causing a lot of stress in our society with people having to learn and earn over a longer period of their lives. Um, so I just uh, leave you with that as a possible paradigm shift that we're going to have to rethink, if you will, the entire structure. Perhaps in the, uh, in the private sector, um, uh, companies will have to do something like the sabbaticals that we have at universities and, uh, and uh, let employees take time off to recharge, to relearn, and to relax. Yeah. Um, I would like to ask some attention for this new person, for the psychology of this new person. I think that we all, uh, with all these brainstorms and think tanks, of this new society spend a lot of time on economic models, on sociological structures, on organizational models. But I do see a big problem arising around people I know, with all the stress of all the emails, the combination of work and kids in one room. I mean, the farm model, working at home, is not that ideal all the time. Um, the being self-employed means who, who will give you a compliment, who will say you did something well, who will comment to you um, in the sense you don't become this autistic thing that only you know, does jobs and goes on. So where does your whole knowledge, your experiences, be transformed into deeper knowledge, embodied knowledge? So there is a whole psychological um, transformation happening that we all have to do that we actually hardly talk about. Oh, okay, I'll let some others answer. I won't hog it, but I'll leave you with my own thoughts on that, which is... Uh, that we have a new context and uh, perhaps some new ways uh, that we need to deal with the psychology. But I don't, I don't personally believe we have a new person. I think the people um, that we remain, uh, that we change over evolutionary, evolu evolutionary and glacial time periods, um, although our context changed much more quickly. Thank you. <laughs> That's cool. Sorry, I, so, sorry, I, I really uh, don't agree. <laughs> no, come back, you. Paul. <laughs> 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 I, I don't agree. Paul. Please, Paul. <laughs> we don't agree. <laughs> come, on, come, back, come, come on, come on. Come on. Hey, Paul. <laughs> Why is this right there, Paul? <laughs> okay, ah, take a thank shot. Thank you very much. That's very kind of you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I, I, I don't agree because if I look at how kids learn, for example, to negotiate over toys, how they learn to deal with disappointment, how they learn about praise, how they learn about sharing, how they learn when they do something and they achieve uh, new skills, how, it, how they get their feedback. All these feedback systems are changing in information society. So I think you are really underestimating the saying that we are this, you know, uh, Neanderthalers forever. Uh, well, that's, I that's a perspective are, I don't share. In the, Middle Ages. in the world of uh, the arts, in the world of production, in the world of sports, uh, people are, in uh, my thinking, essentially paid for the number of lives that they touch. If you're a star of a big film and that film is seen by literally hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, 
uh, in the cinema and then subsequently by tens of millions or hundreds of millions over television, even if your compensation is in the range of uh, only pennies per head, uh, you're going to be making lots of money. And uh, that's how I approach that particular issue at this point in time. And it's certainly the argument I make to my own shareholders when we're <laughs> discussing my own compensation. Every Once you've got them trapped in your Correct. method, then you can begin to, uh, to, to start add the charges. The charges. Right. Brian Arthur wrote an excellent book uh, on the law of increasing returns. This law applied to, to Microsoft, obviously, with their Windows. Once you are, the bottom line of this law is he who has gets. Because in software business, it, Microsoft, who sort of captured most of the operating system, uh, and, and they now can charge as much as they can. But this is not the first occurrence of the law of increasing returns. Obviously, Gillette figured it out. Uh, Sony did not figure it out. Now VHS is a JVC did. Uh, if you go as far back as 100 years ago, the uh, internal combustion gen engine came out on, in time of the steam engine uh, basically taking most of the market. And they captured the, the, by accident, they captured most of the distribution channels. And we're now all driving the internal combustion engines, and, you know, uh, screwing up our environment because of what happened 100 years ago. Um, once again, I've uh, been convinced uh, of the uh, the good um, use of these types of uh, activities, uh, both on your end and on this end. And uh, I would uh, say up to the 60th anniversary celebration of the Living McLuhan. And after that, uh, many others. Thank you very much. It has been a pleasure. So to stay within the proper forms, this is a goodbye. I want to thank uh, the, the Council for having positioned government, at least in those terms, just between the world of art and the world of business. That is, in terms of time, artists have all the time unpaid or otherwise to do what they want. Government, a little mo less time, and business even less so. So time being of the essence, thank you so much for being with us. And we meet again this uh, tomorrow morning at... Uh, Hey, uh, <laughs> eight o'clock. Ah. All right. So this is goodbye. I have to make it formal. Ciao. <laughs>